Good. All right, I think I am now recording. And so be careful what you say. All right, now uh, this is going to be uh, recorded and it's, it's, it's being recorded locally, not in the Zoom cloud, but you know how these things tend to exist forever. I'm gonna go back to my screen share so we can look at the agenda. Okay, so today we're gonna to start with our welcome and introductions. We're gonna go over some exciting information about the Democratic Party structure. Uh, this is way complicated, and I'm going to talk about it at the highest level. That is the kind of information that we as Central Committee members uh, most need to understand. Um, and then I'll talk to you about how to figure other things out if you get into the more complicated pieces. Um, Gene's going to talk about how we build and use power. And that is, I, I, I think if, if, if I would have uh, member, new members especially understand anything, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's that when we're doing it well as members of the Central Committee, we are, we are creating power by acting efficiently and effectively together. If, if, there, if a, you see a Central Committee member or an officer, director, or any member trying to like hoard power to themselves, there, as in any other context, they're almost certainly diminishing the power of the group and doing the wrong thing. Um, we, we have to create this power through effective collective action. And, and I, we use the word power because that's how the other side thinks of it. And whatever perspective you come from, um, you know, there is whatever you're hoping to do through the Democratic Party or through the progressive movement, there are forces trying to do other things or prevent you from doing what you want to do because they feel that will be a loss for them. And they think of that uh, struggle in terms of power and we have to as well. And Jim will talk about that and various aspects of it. Then we'll take a brief pause to see if there are questions uh, at that point. Um, then we'll go more specifically into our local party organization. This will be some lets and bolts about um, about how our party and its documents are organized. And then um, we will uh, talk, uh, we, after that we will have some of our, we'll have our current officers and directors who haven't yet spoken. So Gene and I will have already spoken by then, but other officers and directors who are present for the call will then um, just briefly introduce who themselves personally, their role and say something about what their role is and what work they're doing in that role. Uh, so that you all understand you know, who you might be able to go to, which director you might go to, to try to do different aspects of this work. Then we'll take a break so people can refill their coffee cups and uh, we'll come back and uh, do a breakout just to let people talk in a smaller group to say, you know, if, hey, I didn't understand when Bill said this, or I wonder why Bill isn't addressing that. And then come back and raise those questions, get them answered, hopefully. And then we'll talk about the organizational meeting on, uh, on January 7th which has a very specific set of tasks that have to be done under our bylaws in a pretty particular way and order. And I just wanna prepare everybody for what that meeting looks like because that it's, it's uh, you know, good to have an idea what's gonna happen that day and to think about what you're gonna do uh, and to be prepared for it. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing now and um, I'm going to try to do uh, this breakout. Now remember that what you talked about in the breakout room, I don't think it'll be recorded. I think the recording that I've started will be either in the main room or in whatever breakout room I get assigned to. And we're only gonna do this for three minutes. Just introduce yourselves to each other. If you get put in a breakout room with people you already know, just say hi and, and, and uh, commiserate about the uh, new, new uh, COVID restrictions. We're all gonna have to, um, um, have to deal with. And I'm going to make them uh, relatively small so everybody can have a chance to introduce themselves and um, and uh, speak a little bit. And we'll be back in like three minutes. You'll get a warning. You'll see a warning there when we're about to come back. And if you go into the breakout, if you don't mind, if you're prepared, I know it's early on Saturday. If you've had a chance to pull yourself together and are comfortable turning your uh, video on, please do that at least for the breakout part uh, so you can introduce yourself and people can see who you are. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes. You might need to join the uh, accept an invitation to join your room. Sorry, Bill, I got to finish something. That's no problem. I'll see who's who's missing out by not having you. I'm not sure that they'll know. I don't think they'll know. Jean, I'm going to let you finish. I'm going to hop into the room you were going to be in, okay? Thank you. The finals process of that. So only have two more left. Hey, Bill. Hi, Allie. How are you? Pretty good. Um, just telling Claudia that I'm uh, going through my uh, first round of finals in my master's program. So oh, wow. congratulations. That's awesome. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So almost done with that. And um, yeah, besides that, I'm just applying to um, different offices of newly elected officials um, uh, and reelected officials, just trying to trying to get a job somewhere. So that's that's really where I'm at. Um, yeah. How about you guys? How's <laughs> Ali, That's like a that's like a that's so much. That's a lot going on uh, in your life. <laughs> I'm this. Stuff's actually calmed down for me. I'm I'm kind of on a break right now, and compared to compared to what I've been doing um, the rest of the year. So, yeah. Um, it's all relative, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So, relatively speaking, I'm um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of uh, kind of taking a break right now. So, oh, okay, being good. Able to catch my breath. Yeah. Good, uh, Claudia. You did you know Ali previously, or are you just meeting Ali? Oh, I, I definitely know Ali. I was very Good. proud to support her candidacy. Fabulous. Um, Ali, I, I just, I'm, I'm so glad. I've been thinking a lot about you. I was so impressed uh, with the campaign, your enthusiasm, your platform. Um, I just have to tell you, I think the world of you, thank you for stepping up to run. I know that uh, many people were inspired by your campaign. And I particularly, just as a, a, an older woman, um, to see the younger generation uh, proceed as bravely as you did, I just, uh, it feel, fills my heart with joy. I just wanna thank you so much uh, for, for running and being who you are. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, you guys are gonna make me cry. That's so kind. Yeah, oh, that's very you. sweet, Claudia. So Ali, I'll give you a moment to compose yourself. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and I'll just add to what Claudia said that, uh, you know, you'll get elected to things if you keep trying because you're a great candidate. You have a lot to offer. And, uh, you know, some of the people that we that are thought of as, um, you know, people think of them about what they were able, what they, the elections that they prevailed on, but a lot of those same people lost elections that were really important to them. I know, you know, Dave Cortese really well, and he really wanted to be mayor of San Jose and would have been a great mayor of San Jose and uh, lost that election. And if he had been like demoralized and not willing to put himself out there again, he wouldn't be heading to Sacramento as our state senator now. So I think it just shows you that you'd have to persist. Joe Samidian, I remember him telling stories about losing his first election and uh, you former Mountain View Council member, Mike Kasperzak and Margaret Abicoga, who's still a rising star, lost an election to run for a local hospital district um, in mm -hmm. uh, North County. And you just, it's part of the thing. It's a, it's, you know, you, you win some and you lose some and then you get on the right trajectory and all of a sudden the doors are opening for you. So just keep at it. You're, you started early enough that you, um, you know, <laughs> have a lot of chances to learn from um, experience and continue to build your relationships and network and it's only going to get you know you'll, you'll you'll only have more and more support oh absolutely absolutely and and thank you guys so much for your kind words um yeah uh, don't get me wrong really would have loved to um have the election go my way this time but um yeah the the voters made their choice and and that's okay you know like some you win some you lose some but yeah it's it definitely hasn't discouraged me i'm definitely going to put my name back out there um, Fabulous. sometime again in the future Fabulous. And, yeah and um yeah, it's uh, yeah, just but it's just been very humbling to see the the support that I've um, like people uh, saying supportive words just like that. So I, I really oh, can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So thank you. That's great. I'm going to close these rooms, and I think it might take sixty seconds or something like that. Yep, here they go. And I'm going to hop out of this room so you guys can chat a little bit while it closes, and then everybody will be back in a minute. Okay. Hi, Jean, I'm back. Okay. The breakout rooms are ending here in a minute. So you, will, you, will you be ready to go on here in a minute or two? I've, I've got a couple of setup slides that I'm going to go over and then yeah. ready to hand over to you. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, good. Hi, Jenny Higgins. I see you're muted, but uh, with everybody's in breakout rooms and they're just going to be oh, coming hi. back. They're coming I'm back sorry. in the next 10 seconds or something. I got home late from my dog grooming but um okay yeah oh my gosh i was I had, if saturday's on my grocery morning so i i had uh i go really super early to avoid being around anybody else but yeah. uh, i've also got back late and had to hustle yeah i have a sheep -a doodle so i had to get them all shaved down or it was going to be a nightmare for a while oh my gosh all right people are coming back i see that we're back 
So I'm going to try to keep us, I uh, hope that was enjoyable for people. I know we're not able to see each other very much these days, um, which is very, uh, very rough on me, I know. And so I'm going to go back to uh, sharing uh, my, my screen. If something came up in your conversation that you think I should know about, or you would like to be considered by the group, mm -hmm. um, then please feel free to drop that into the, uh, into the chat. And, uh, and then um, we will be ready to go in um, into the next uh, thing we're doing here. So I'm going to share my agenda again, or my slides rather. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about party structure, and then Gene's going to take over and talk a little bit about what we do and how we, what, to, to, what, uh, what we can do to good effect. So uh, there's this funny question. Uh, yeah, this is really dates me. Uh, who are we and why are we here? Uh, there's this funny thing in the uh, in the debate uh, in 1992 uh, when uh, Admiral Stockdale, who was picked by Ross Perot as the Reform Party vice presidential candidate, was in the debate. And uh, it, two things are memorable. Uh, one was that when the others were talking, he turned down his uh, hearing aid to preserve the battery, so he wasn't even listening to what they said. But um, also, he just like asked this funny question, like, who am I? Why am I here? Um, well, I think it's important to think about, like, what's the Democratic Party? Why are we all doing this? What's our purpose? And, uh, and, and really, we have three major areas. So we are the Democratic Party in Santa Clara County. Nobody else can say that they are. We're, we're the Democratic Party in Santa Clara County. And our job is to grow the party. We do that through voter registration, visibility activities, like showing up farmers markets and things like that, and our permanent office and our volunteer staff who are there to interact with the public even in the election off season. Um, and Judy Pipkin and uh, James Kim could tell you all kinds of stories about what that's like um, uh, to be and represent the Democratic Party to the general public. We represent, think, and speak for our party. And uh, we do that through resolutions and communications like our website and things I say publicly and letters that I write on behalf of the party and through any advocacy we do as a party and through the party, making public comment as officers of the party representing the party. And um, uh, that part about thinking for the party, and in addition to speaking for a part, the party, I think is very important because we have to gather and consider information and make good choices in adopting resolutions so that we're adopting positions of the Democratic Party here in Santa Clara County that are well supported and consistent with our democratic and progressive values. And then finally, we recruit, train, uh, elect, and guide Democratic candidates and elected officials. Um, the guide part is really about, um, uh, you know, uh, advocating and, and uh, trying to, to, to get them to adopt the policies that we think they should adopt. So some of you know this part very well. Uh, the party structure, the big D at the top is the Democratic National Committee. That's the National Democratic Party. They're actually a fairly, um, they were fairly active in the Trump years, but in general, they're kind of a shell. They're kind of a collection of organizations. They're sort of an umbrella and they ramp up and become more active and frankly become better funded when, um, uh, when during the presidential election cycles. Now, I think that presidential election cycles, like all election cycles, have gotten to be pretty well continuous. And so there's always some level of activity, but just want people to understand that for us way down at the bottom of this organization and structure that we don't get resources from the national party they're not some wealthy entity that can fund us we don't there's no budget that trickles down to us uh it is a it's a shell and uh the work of the democratic party is done by people like us those of us on this call so the national democratic party charters 50 state democratic parties and uh, those Democratic parties uh, are run typically by a state central committee uh, or some organ like that and operate under their own bylaws. Uh, under campaign finance laws, every, at every stage, the federation of the FARC parties is on, on the one hand pretty controlling because each entity dictates and controls the, and designates who below them in the structure has the authority to, um, to designate um, and be the Democratic Party in that jurisdiction. But under campaign finance rules, there's also a fairly high degree of independence desired uh, because if we're acting independently as a local Democratic Party, our activities are not lumped in with the rest of the state party and the national party for purposes of campaign spending limits and things of that nature. 
So um, in California, every county, it's like 58 counties, almost all of them have a Democratic Central Committee. Some of the smaller and more rural counties in more red parts of the state don't, but uh, uh, virtually all the counties have a Democratic County Central Committee. And we are, again, a federation affiliated with the state Democratic Party. There are some ways in which they operate, they exercise very strict control over us. And, uh, and there are other ways in which we act uh, very much independently uh, by design so that our, um, uh, our, our activities, our campaign activities um, are kept separate from the state party and not aggregated with them for purposes of, of campaign uh, spending limits. Um, so going to this next slide, it just shows off to the right side the specific activities that are sort of reserved to the specific jurisdictions, kind of how the, how the authority and work is divided up between these entities. So obviously the Democratic National Committee uh, determines the national nominees for president and vice president. Um, it has the, um, uh, uh, it, it has the um, uh, national platform, it de determines the national platform, and they have these national committees. So like the Democratic Senate uh, Campaign Committee and other committees like that are actually organs of the DNC um, and the National Democratic Governors Association. I think there's an Attorneys General Association and a Secretaries of State Association, the Democratic ones, not the national um, bipartisan ones. And those are all um, uh, kind of administered and under the umbrella and authority of the DNC. Uh, so at the state level, the California Democratic Party is very clear. It has state bylaws. We'll talk about where those live. And uh, they reserve to, them, to themselves the sole authority to do endorsements of the Democratic Party in any partisan race, including races that are local to a given county. So for example, that's a state assembly member or above, any, any race in which um, candidates run with a, um, a label as their um, party uh, of uh, preference. Similarly, they reserve the right in nonpartisan races that are not local to any one county. And so races that cross county boundaries, a typical example is Board of Equalization. Those are also determined by the state Democratic Party. Now, the good news is that the rules under which they do that give us as county central committee members uh, some voice as local delegates and then ultimately as delegates to the state convention, which we'll talk about later. Um, uh, the state party has a state platform uh, that's on their website, kadam.org. They do state resolutions and state resolutions are, um, you know, have the authority of the California Democratic Party. And when you're advocating for something and you get your resolution passed at the state level, you can list the California De Democratic Party as being a co-sponsor and supporter of your position. And then finally, they have some statewide chartered organizations um, uh, that um, are chartered by the California Democratic Party. Then our local county Democratic Party, we have the exclusive ability to give the Democratic Party endorsement to candidates for local nonpartisan races. That's anything below assembly member that is wholly within Santa Clara County. And uh, that means there's no other Democratic entity that can, there's no other entity that can say that they're going to confer the, um, uh, the endorsement of the Democratic Party in those races. We're the only ones. And the, we similarly have a local platform. This is one of the things that I'll encourage everyone to read if you haven't already. Those of you who've been involved in the pre preparation of the platform, uh, it, it was updated in recent years, but it lives on our website, sccdp.org, and just look for the platform and, uh, or search for it, search for the word platform. And uh, it sets forth our uh, expression of democratic values with respect to issues that come up frequently in local uh, jurisdictions. And then uh, we're able to act through local re resolutions and um, by chartering our, our local clubs. Um, okay. So uh, we are elected to four year terms. And so that's because the only election that Democrats or any party has strict control over the ballot is the presidential primary election. With this cursed uh, top two primary, we, um, we, we, there's, the presidential primary election is the only election in which the government prepares a ballot that is specifically for Democrats. So, uh, it, it, so in the presidential primary election, which is either in March or June, uh, depending on what the legislature has done in that year, um, uh, we run for election, which most of you know, because you've recently done it. And we're going to take office in January, which is the beginning of our two-year organizational term. And so we're elected for 2021 to 2025, but our first two-year organizational term is, um, is 2021 and 2022. Uh, 
Um, did I get that wrong? 2021? Yeah. So I'm sorry, 21 to 24, I think is our term, but the, or until January of 25, perhaps. But the, um, the first two year uh, part of the term after an election is this time when we're getting organized ourselves and our work is to grow and build uh, the party through activities like voter registration and networking with other progressive uh, groups. Uh, you know, the visibility events we're talking about, building our own capacity through training um, and, uh, and filling out our, our, our organization recruiting volunteers. Um, the next phase is the recruiting and preparing, recruiting candidates and preparing both the candidates and ourselves for the upcoming election cycle. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the phase of, of doing our endorsements and working to elect the people that we've endorsed. So that's, our, that's the, 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 the repeating kind of two-year cycle based on which we're organized. And our January meeting is the beginning of this current upcoming cycle. So then I've put in the middle here, uh, this idea of advocating. Um, we've had in the past the concept of uh, odd years, using odd years to try to advance policy and even years to focus on elections. And I think that, um, you know, you can't, obviously those of you who have uh, been activists and have organized successfully uh, to get, uh, you know, progressive values embodied in legislation that is then executed in the correct way to achieve the objective, know that you can't only do that in odd years and, and focus only on elections and even years. Um, and so that's something that's really should be going on uh, continuously and, and opportunistically uh, throughout the two-year cycle. So now we're finally going to get to Jean Cohen. Uh, Jean is the vice chair of the uh, Democratic Party. Everybody knows she's also the interim director of the uh, executive director of the South Bay Labor Council and a political director and organizer with the Building Trades. And Jean's going to talk about how we build and use power um, uh, with, as a Democratic Party. So I am going to stop sharing in case Jean wants to share something. Oh, thank you, Bill. Good morning, Democrats. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, many of you are um, experts and uh, familiar with the party, but some of you are new. And so Bill and I just wanted to give an overview of some of the entry points to engage in our work. So we've put together this um, presentation for you. So just please give me one moment to get this set up. Can folks see this? Yeah, okay. So let me just minimize this. So for the Democratic Party, there are a variety of opportunities and responsibilities that we all have. Um, the county committees drive the frontline efforts of the party, uh, registering and educating voters, protecting the right to vote, and working to elect candidates who will fight for our values. Um, there are multiple and diverse opportunities for you to be an active participant and leader, and we will be the most effective and powerful when everyone contributes um, to our collective efforts. Next. So um, broadly, we want to think about what are the opportunities to engage, what are the opportunities to build power, opportunities to organize, educate, and learn within the um, roles and responsibilities that we have as elected members of the Central Committee. Electoral politics is a really uh, critical role um, that we play in Santa Clara County. And there are various activities that happen during off election years and on election uh, cycle years as Bill mentioned. Um, we have a multi-step process to vet and educate um, and endorse qualified candidates. And that process is overseen by the Director of Candidate Recruitment Endorsements. Um, and there are all sorts of different ways for you to get involved in this process. Um, we have interviews, we have questionnaires, and we have voting, and that all requires time and, um, and thought to make sure that our, um, our um, recommendations are the most reflective of our values. Our political and campaign field program, uh, is, it's sophisticated and it's impactful. Um, it's, it's driven by um, a, a lot of folks, but in particular, our field services director and executive director um, oversee um, volunteers and interns that do an enormous amount of work. Um, and this is work that we invite you to do as well, whether it's coming up with um, phone banking or registration of uh, voters canvassing, 
text banking, all of these opportunities that many of you are familiar with really um, uh, allow us to be successful at the ballot box. And we don't do this work in isolation. Um, we have partners um, with the labor movement, with democratic clubs. We coordinate with independent expenditures to really make sure that we have um, the ability to influence the outcomes of these races. We do trainings and engage our volunteers. Um, we have some really amazing folks that will put together graphics and other tools for us to be successful. This year we had um, images like these that we promoted that really showed the diversity um, of the candidates that we support. And we always want to just lift up our volunteers and um, the members of this body that are, are doing the work. Even though things are really challenging right now, it's also fun and we have to remember to, to find the place to have the fun. So I wanna speak briefly to issues advocacy opportunities. Uh, this is a critical role that the party plays in shaping and passing legislation at all levels of government. This includes school boards, uh, city governments, uh, supervisors, um, what happens in Sacramento and Washington DC as well. And under the leadership of our issues director, we utilize our formal party platform to advance our causes and stand up for good policy and, and fight to advance our agenda. Our policies and um, platforms are on our website if you're not familiar with them. And it's a great way to get educated about um, what our issues are. And then our resolutions are formally adopted by this body and then we use them as a, as a platform and a space to go out and speak about them and advocate as Bill mentioned. So I know this is small text, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the diversity of resolutions and advocacy that the party works on whether it's um, exposing Lundy F as a fake Democrat to help David Cohen win or um, condemning gender bias uh, in elected leaders and really identifying opportunities around ethnic studies curriculum and ways to diversify and make sure that the party is focused on equity and anti-racist um, and uh, pro-people and pro-worker agendas. And this really falls into the category here. Um, I see that our Director of Gender Equity uh, and the Status of Women, Shay franco Clausen, is with us this morning. I know that Shay is really a leader in helping the party figure out what our goals and our activities are to achieve gender parity and representation. Um, also on our website, I invite you to look at the resolution on um, gender parity and the goal that we set of having elected women uh, doubled um, in Santa Clara County. We still have uh, some work to do, but we have goals and a commitment to get it done. I also wanted to identify CEDAW as a policy area that we have a coalition um, of democratic activists working on to make sure that every government um, municipality in Santa Clara County passes this resolution um, that advances policies um, for equity and representation for women. And Bill James, our leader, is also a feminist. Just wanted to identify that. Thank you, Bill. Education and training. Uh, the Santa Clara County Democratic Party leadership team organizes a diverse educational and training program for our members, for candidates and allies. These are great opportunities to learn and engage um, new party activists in our work. And we utilize these opportunities to advance anti-racist, pro-LGBTQ and pro-equity discussions and policies. And we also want to be open and bold in the work that we're doing around this. Um, you can see the flyer here for a training we put together for candidates running for office. We wanted to educate them, build relationships with them. And then the picture on the left is Congresswoman Anna Eshoo speaking to some of our volunteers and interns about um, policy issues. Here's some of our volunteers doing the important work during COVID and it's been really challenging, but also very inspiring. So what are our next steps? Uh, the Santa Clara County Democratic Central Committee is a working committee and your elected representatives responsible for doing this work and we do it together. So I invite you to think about how you wanna lead and engage in the next few years. How do you wanna build power for the Democratic Party? Whether it's recruiting candidates, a volunteering, recruiting other volunteers, donating money and your time, really just educating people about the power and the importance of democratic values. 
are all opportunities for you to reflect on and for us to come together to do the important work of the party. So thank you so much, Bill. Happy to answer any questions either now or later. Oh, and here's your opportunity to get active right now. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, so that's a great overview of all the, of, of the ways that you can get involved. One thing I appreciated that you said, Jean, uh, because it's a, I don't wanna be the only one to say it, which is that we're a working committee. And uh, those of you who have served on board, sometimes you're on a board and it's an honorary thing. Sometimes you're on a board and they, and, uh, you know, they, they need guidance from you every once in a while. But sometimes you're on a board and there really isn't anybody to do the work if you don't step up and collectively do it. And that's what our central committee is. We don't, we don't have an enormous paid staff that uh, we just guide and direct through our decision making. If we want good things to happen in Santa Clara County, we really, um, we really need to... Um, we really need to step up and do this work uh, work ourselves. So um, I'm going to. Uh, I also appreciated your mentioning the the uh, gender equity position. Um, the the that's a good example for those of you who don't know that background. Uh, back in uh, back in uh, some years back, Dawn, uh, the Democratic activist for women, now came to the Central Committee, and uh, with a proposal to create that um, uh, 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 position and to set forth the goals that uh, Jean was, was uh, mentioning. And so years ago, they took that action. We adopted that in our bylaws, both the substantive goals and the creation of the position. And so we now have um, uh, this a, a, an actual directorship uh, for uh, gender equity and the status of women and to work on these specific goals that we've established. It's an example of how to go from having an idea about the Democratic Party should be doing something more in a certain dimension and really uh, stepping up to do it. Another example is the youth representative. We have a voting youth representative on our central committee. That came out of our youth, our first, first youth takeover back in 2018. And uh, the young people uh, then who were leading that effort uh, uh, came to me and said, well, can, can, you know, can we bring any resolution that we wanna bring? And uh, they kind of came up with the idea of asking for your third wish from the genie from the bottle to be three more wishes. And so um, uh, what they came forward with was a resolution that said, well, we don't wanna just have a youth takeover every once in a while. We wanna have a voice on the central committee uh, you know, all the time. It, can, we, can we pass a resolution that says we're gonna create a position? And, uh, and they did, and the central committee affirmed what they did. And uh, as a result, we have a voting member. So you can really you know, affect not only outside external uh, uh, activities, but you can change the structure and rules and focus of our party uh, through activism at the central committee. So um, I am going to go back to uh, sharing my screen in just a minute, but I'm gonna take a moment now. I'm gonna put you all in uh, gallery view on my screen. And I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to answer one question I saw from Ava, which I think was answered correctly uh, uh, in the chat, uh, and then ask people if you want to, you can either just speak up because we're a small group, or you can raise your blue hand and, and ask a question. Ava's question was about a forum and a place for central committee members to discuss. That's something that we've discussed from time to time and could consider doing. And so I'd be very open um, and, uh, to uh, hearing a proposal that, uh, that would be able to do that in an effective way. We're not strictly speaking uh, required to follow the Brown Act, so that's not a consideration. I, I do observe that in some of the forums of which I'm a member or have been an observer, there is a tendency for um, people to behave differently than they do when they're in the context of a more formal meeting or an in-person meeting, um, specifically by shouting at each other a little bit, shouting each other down a little bit, sometimes engaging in other disrespectful behaviors. So I think we would need a forum where it was closed just so that we could exchange ideas freely and not have outsiders using the information against us. Once we, when we speak as a party, we wanna to speak together and with one voice. Um, I don't express my opinion about things that the Central Committee uh, has authority over, such as in, uh, uh, endorsements in local races, uh, because I do want our party to speak with one voice and not have people saying that, um, uh, you know, pulling out a, a conversation from another thread. Uh, but it's something I know um, it's a vehicle and a place and a way to exchange information and ideas and, and engage each other. Um, and so it's something we could do if we had a good structure um, and uh, could do it in a way that um, uh, only, you know, lifted up our work and didn't drag it down. Are there any other questions that people had they wanted to answer now? Uh, we'll have a chance at the end, you can ask any question you want, but if something that Jean said or I said raised a question for you, 
Um, is there any other uh, question right now? If not, let's let's keep moving forward. And then if we get to the end and, and we haven't covered the information that you're most interested in, again, please feel free to, um, to speak up. All right, I'm gonna go back to my slides so I remember where we are. Okay, we just did our questions. So the local party organization, um, this part is not exciting, but I'm gonna share, I'll send these slides to everybody at the end and I'll share a link to the recording so that you have the information. But um, of course, the information that you want to know uh, uh, about uh, the official party entities can be found on their websites. Uh, the DNC actually um, has a page where they collect things that are their, um, their bylaws, uh, uh, their, their kind of constitutional document. An interesting thing about the DNC is that that document itself is less useful on a day-to-day -day basis than some other documents. It's a very high level thing. It's a little more like the constitution uh, and, and less like the operational rules. And the reason is that the national DNC has a, a committee that makes, um, they make rules through a rulemaking process for each four year election cycle and each convention. And then the convention, of course, has the ability to adopt and make rules for itself. And so their process is a little bit different, but there is a constitution and bylaws of the DNC and you can find it on the page uh, that's here. It's not easy to find. Um, I had to dig for it a little bit. Um, again, it's not, uh, the, uh, that might be by design because it's, it's less of a useful day-to-day -day document. But there, are, on this page that's linked here, there are other uh, resources that might be of interest if you're trying to figure something out at the national uh, level. The California Democratic Party uh, has gone by CDP, uh, but they more recently have been using CADEM, which is their URL, CADEM.org. Um, in the bylaws page, their, their site is pretty easy to navigate. They've got a good search function and, and uh, drop down menus, uh, but their bylaws are there. At some point before the state convention in 2021, I encourage you to look at those bylaws and uh, just familiarize yourself with the structure and the kind of uh, uh, flow of the two-year cycle that's sort of defined by the, uh, the California Democratic Party bylaws. Um, their endorsement process is complicated. Uh, their membership is complicated. Uh, and uh, we'll talk in a little bit uh, uh, about the fact that we as central committee members have an opportunity to elect a certain number of delegates to the state party. And it's fortunately because we have so many Democrats in Santa Clara County, it's a good number and it's sufficient to uh, elect our elected and elected equivalent members to be delegates to the state party. So in addition to being members of our county central committee, we're also delegates to the state party, which gives us a chance to go to the convention and have a say at uh, about those state uh, um, endorsements, Democratic party endorsements in assembly and Senate and congressional races, for example. Then uh, the Santa Clara County Democratic Party, uh, the, our bylaws are on our website, sccdp.org. You're probably familiar with that website already. Um, all of our social media, our handle is at sccdp. Um, so Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, uh, that's our, our um, uh, you should, if you would, uh, actually uh, whatever social media you use regularly, if you would go and follow or like our, our site, uh, whatever is appropriate for that um, channel, um, we'd appreciate that because then you'll see more of our information that gets posted uh, to that channel. Um, and our bylaws are among the information that's available at the SECDP page. Uh, the bylaws page is actually a landing page that has some links to PDF documents. One of them is the bylaws, but we also have legislation, which I always put in quotes because I kind of get these are sort of less than bylaws. Uh, not um, uh, it might be hard have been hard for the uh, founding fathers of the central committee our central committee uh, to have come up with the right word for them. But they're basically like standing uh, rules that are easier to change than the bylaws. The bylaws require a two thirds vote to change. Uh, with the exception of one set of cleanup changes that we make every two year cycle. Um, but the, uh, we'll talk about the, the, the legislation that's been passed to govern specific things like clubs and the executive board and, and endorsements. Then we have a limited number of standing rules. We have our kind of our customs and practices. And then finally, our bylaws say that if anything else doesn't cover um, our process, then Robert's rules of order uh, apply. 
Now I'll mention about Robert's rules of order. Those are really important so that we have organized meetings that are not chaotic and where everybody gets a fair chance to have their say. And we uh, then have a vote that's clear and members get to express their actual will. And um, you know, I've had to learn a lot about Robert's rules of orders. There's a lot of edge cases and strange things. And there's some motions where there's debate and there's other motions that require more than a majority vote. Um, but the basic stuff about how to make a motion, how to be heard, how to ask a question about procedure so that you can be answered. Um, you know, it's good to look at a, you know, a 10 minute video or read a short article online about Robert's rules so that you are not feeling intimidated by other people's knowledge of the rules, because some people know the rules and try to use them to either inject chaos or to kind of control the dynamic of a meeting. And uh, it's important to follow the rules so that we're fair and consistent. Um, and so if you try to do something at a meeting that isn't consistent with the rules, uh, and I know it and they recognize it, I will rule it out of order. Uh, I try, generally try to do that in a way that um, provides an opportunity for people to correct kind of just procedural errors um, if that's appropriate. And uh, I'm always available to be consulted with um, uh, if you're unsure. If you want to bring something forward and don't know how to do it, uh, then it's always okay to reach out to me and say, I have this idea, I'm concerned about something, but I don't know how to kind of get it under uh, treat, dealt with by the central committee. Can you help me do that? Um, and I'm always willing to do that. So our bylaws uh, are at this bylaws page, and I'm gonna go over some of these headings just briefly and then talk about a couple of the, um, uh, of the items. So uh, these are typical, uh, the, the article one name, organization and purpose. I encourage you to read that because it talks about some of the information that Gene and I have mentioned about what the central committee is about and why it exists. There's a section on membership, how you become a member, who gets a vote, who doesn't have a vote. Um, and we'll talk about membership in just a minute. Uh, voting, which is how we do votes and can conduct votes and decide you know, the outcome of a vote. There's a section on officers, which also includes directors. Um, there's a section on the executive board in terms of how it works and what its authority is. There's a section on meetings and how we're gonna conduct them, vacancies, how they're filled. Um, and then there's a section on uh, censure, sanctions and removal. We'll talk briefly about that just so people are aware of those rules and, and what they do and do not provide. And then um, there's a part about committees and task forces. Uh, procedures to enact legislation, which is where we'll talk about those the acts that have been adopted in the past and exist now. Uh, how to do resolutions, uh, the requirement for dues. There are rules of decorum. Um, uh, uh, these are rules that uh, that I wrote uh, and and had the central and got the central committee to pass and early in my tenure, my first ten, uh, tour as uh, as uh, chair in response to feedback that I received while running for chair from people about concerns have been expressed in the past and not really feeling like there had been a vehicle to uh, address them. Uh, so we'll talk briefly about those. And then there are procedural rules, which more or less say the rules are what we say in the bylaws, except that uh, we don't, if they don't deal with them, then Robert's rules applies. Severability, which is a funny legal thing about you know being able to enforce the bylaws, even if some of them don't work. And then uh, how we amend the bylaws, which is really a two thirds vote normally, but once every two years, we do sort of a set of cleanup changes to the bylaws that only require a majority vote. And uh, I do encourage people, as boring as it is, the bylaws are like 12 pages long. If go to the website, get a copy of the bylaws, look them over so you're familiar with what's in there. And uh, that way you won't be caught off guard by something. And uh, if something is happening that you think isn't quite right based on what you remember seeing in the bylaws, you can raise that as a concern. Membership and voting. So this is an interesting thing about our central committee that's a little unique. Uh, we have um, by law, if you look in the elections code, it's like elections, California elections code section 7200 and the ones following that deal with democratic central committees and every qualified party has a section in the elections code about how their uh, central committees are, um, are elected. And uh, the bottom line is that for Santa Clara County, we are elected uh, six, we elect six representatives per assembly district. And, uh, and then by our bylaws, we have elected equivalent members to increase the membership of those assembly districts that are more holy inside Santa Clara County. Because of course, every assembly district has this, uh, roughly the same number of people in it. 
And so the ones that cross over our county border into other areas, and in particular, the ones in the South County, 8029 and 8030, that have significant sections outside of the county, those um, the kind of representation uh, of the more populous and more fully in the county uh, districts, uh, what it was proportionally less in terms of the number of people uh, that were represented by each member of the Central Committee. So we synthesized uh, and increased the number of representatives. And uh, by because it was hard, as it turned out, it was hard to have a conversation about changing at the state level, changing the rules to uh, adjust the way that we uh, elect our representatives. And so instead, what we did was in our bylaws, we created these elected equivalent members. And so some of us are elected members, some of us are elected equivalent members. All of us are co-equal members of the Central Committee. When we made that change, we made that clear in the bylaws that elected equivalent members have all the rights and privileges of elected members. Um, and it, so that's a total of, kind of, there's 11 elected equivalent members. There's a formula in the bylaws that talks about how they're allocated. Um, we will be needing to address the question of the reapportionment that will be happening uh, in the coming years. Uh, as a, uh, So probably we'll need some change in our bylaws to talk about, um, uh, to make clear that those of us who were just elected have a four-year term and we remain members regardless of whether the 80s move underneath us. And uh, also to talk about how we adjust the elected equivalent members for the 2024 um, uh, 20 election. Um, and then we have ex officio members. Uh, by state law, our, um, our nominee, or if, whether elected or not, our nominee for assembly districts, senate districts, and congressional districts within our um, uh, within our county or that with any part in our county are ex officio voting members of our central committee. And that again is in the elections code. So that's not an optional thing that we decided. So uh, we have a lot of those. I don't have the exact number in mind, but you obviously six assembly districts and three senate districts and some, or maybe four and then some members of Congress. So um, uh, a good number of ex officio members in our Santa Clara County Democratic uh, Central Committee. Uh, under our bylaws, chartered clubs uh, each have one vote. And so um, uh, we have a fairly large number of club representatives with a vote on our central committee. And uh, they uh, participate and are active to varying degrees depending on the club and the personalities involved and the individual they appoint as their representative. Um, but, uh, but each of them is entitled to a voting, uh, uh, a voting member on the central committee. Then uh, members of the DNC and California Democratic Party regional directors who live in Santa Clara County and aren't already a member of our central committee are also voting members of our central committee. So uh, this is pretty much Otto Lee now because he's a DNC rep member who lives in Santa Clara County. Um, our regional directors, Rocky Fernandez and Henny Kelly don't live in Santa Clara County, so they wouldn't be qualified here. And then Omar is an elected member of our central committee, so uh, he's already a member and doesn't become a member again by virtue of being a regional director. And uh, in fact, our bylaws say that you can only be a member in one capacity at any one time, every one person, one vote kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, we have a voting member who is our youth representative. And, uh, and that is, I mentioned earlier, the origin of, of, uh, of that position. Uh, alternates and proxies. So this sometimes is a point of confusion. Uh, you can designate a person who's kind of your standing stand-in um, uh, uh, by, by designating them as your primary alternate. And then you are allowed to designate a secondary alternate as well. And when you uh, do that, you can, if you know that there's gonna be a meeting or two through the year that you won't be able to make, you should designate a primary alternate who can likely be there for you at that time. And then if there's any meeting where you don't show up, your primary alternate is there, they can vote for you in that meeting. Uh, so it should be somebody whose judgment you trust or who will take direction if you want them to take direction um, from you as to how they vote. Um, I remember I, my first time having a vote on central committee was as primary alternate to Sally Lieber. Uh, she'd been elected to the state assembly and she was not able to attend our meetings because she was doing the assembly work during most of the times. And um, at her, she just basically said, I trust you <laughs> and your values and you should use your judgment. And then if anybody's unhappy with it, I'll tell them to talk to you. And so uh, 
I appreciated that. So if, if you're a member who won't be able to make many of our meetings, and that sometimes happens with ex officio members, uh, designating a solid primary alternate is judgment you trust is uh, important. And then if you mostly can attend, but you have a friend who, uh, that you'd like to help get engaged in our work, designating them as your primary alternate can, can be a way to do that. And then if you happen to not uh, be able to attend, but they make it, uh, the good news is you get counted as being present uh, by representation and um, you won't get into any trouble uh, for uh, having poor attendance. Now you can also designate a proxy for a given meeting. So let's say you have a primary alternate or whether you do or not, but for a given meeting, there's gonna be an important vote that you care about, but you can't make that meeting. And uh, so um, uh, for, for kind of a one-time thing up to, I think it's two or three meetings in the course of a year, you can designate somebody as your proxy for that meeting. Uh, and so people use that when they almost always attend and there are a good number of meeting members who almost always are able to attend our meetings and they don't feel like they wanna name an alternate because they're usually able to make it, but they can designate a proxy for the off channel time, the odd time when they're not able to make it. And then finally, we have this concept of associate members. I think this, this is, uh, I'm not sure what the origin of this was originally. It's most often used now, honestly, to create a way for those um, who get elected by the central committee to be state delegates. They have to be on our roster as a member of our central committee. And so um, we can make them an associate member of our central committee under our bylaws. And they don't have any voting right, but they're on our roster. The other place this comes up is that when we do state conventions to which people have to travel, like in non-COVID time, uh, sometimes people can't travel to the convention and they'll appoint a proxy to the state convention um, who is not an, already a member of our central committee. And those people have to be added as associate members as well so that we can include them on our roster so that the state deems them eligible to replace our central committee member as uh, their proxy at the, central, at the state um, convention. So the total number, you know, it's like 40, 47 um, uh, uh, elected and elected equivalent members. And, and between the ex officio members, the club representatives, the youth representatives and the DNC representative, it's almost double that. Uh, and so uh, it's not quite that though, it's something, it's 80 something. Um, and so you can realize that on, it's kind of a big central committee as central committees go. Uh, and our votes as elected and elected equivalent members are, you know, not really diluted, but uh, but they are are shared as well with the ex officio members and the club representatives and the DNC member and the youth representative. Um, and so when you think about the central committee and trying to get something passed by the central committee, that's the body of people who have a vote, and uh, those are the people you want to talk to 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 try to support what you're trying to do. So our bylaws define our officers, uh, directors, and a few appointed officers. Um, and I'm gonna take a second to make sure my team is not trying to text me with any uh, questions. No. Um, so uh, the officers of the central committee that are elected by the members are include a chair, a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. Those are defined in the bylaws. Their duties are defined in the bylaws. In addition, there are a few number of appointed officers there's a uh, legal counsel, which is really just hiring a lawyer. Uh, and then there's a parliamentarian uh, who helps the chair uh, make rulings about Robert's rules of orders. There's an executive director. It's currently James Kim. He's here with us on the call. And uh, there's a sergeant at arms, which is currently Emily Ramos, who uh, in COVID times has been uh, doing a great job and times before that, doing a great job uh, keeping time at our meetings and keeping people on track and new meetings moving forward. Um, and then we have these directors. I'm not sure if it's like the constitution where like the order of succession is decided by the order that they're listed here. Uh, I think this is just uh, the original ones were just in whatever order they were in. And then the new ones that were created at the end more recently are added to the end. Uh, but there is a, a director of voter registration and community services. There's a director of finance, a director of campaign services, a director of clubs. There's one of candidate recruitment and endorsements. Uh, director of Issues, who most often deals with resolutions and the platform, uh, Communications, uh, and then Gender Equity and the Status of Women. We talked about the creation of that. And then Inclusion and Diversity, which was created during the last two-year term, but which has not yet been filled, and so it will have to be filled in the coming term. Um, and that's really also the product of a resolution uh, and a proposal to change the bylaws. 
And uh, that resolution talks about that position as being important to ensure representation both in the Central Committee and its work, and also in the candidates that we are supporting and electing to, uh, to office. So that'll be a pretty important uh, role. So um, I'm gonna, I am gonna stop in a minute and let people ask questions they may have. So just jot them down if you have them uh, and uh, we'll go over them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover the next bit as well and then take a, a, a pause for questions. And then we're gonna have our officers and directors who are on the call introduce themselves and just say a minute about what it is that they do and, and what they wanna, would wanna share with members. So the rules of decorum, there's a section in our bylaws called rules of decorum. And it has to do with such things about how we behave in our meetings and how we interact with each other, how we interact with the public, especially when we're acting officially in our role as a member of the Central Committee. Um, more recently, the state party adopted a code of conduct. The link to their code of conduct is uh, on the page that's here in this URL. And our Central Committee adopted that state code of conduct and incorporated it into our rules of conduct. Um, so it's important to read uh, the rules of decorum section of our bylaws and also the state code of conduct. Uh, we'll actually be sending you a, a thing to fill out online to acknowledge that you've read both uh, and understand um, uh, that you're bound by them as members of our, of our county central committee. And uh, that's, we're gonna be doing that in part because uh, our bylaws uh, say that we do that. Uh, we're not supposed to engage in ad hominem attacks on other members or toward any person when we're acting in our capacity and role as a member of the Central Committee. So obviously when you're in a full place where your status as a member of our Central Committee is uh, why you're there and you're sort of speaking as a member of our Central Committee, uh, uh, the, the, this kind of conduct is considered to be a violation of our rule of decorum and obviously sexual harassment or any form of harassment or personal abuse. Um, and the last thing is consequences, potential consequences. You can, if you violate the rules of decorum, you can be censured uh, by a two thirds vote of the uh, central committee. And there's some procedural requirements about notice and, and action by the executive board before that happens. Um, other sanctions provisions. These are unpleasant things, but it's important to know about them. Uh, and so I'm sorry, I don't mean to be negative in focusing on them, but I think that as new members, especially it's important to be aware of them. Uh, so our bylaws do provide that a member can be removed by a two third vote uh, for the reasons that are listed here. Um, one is for not being present in person or through an alternate or proxy for three meetings in a calendar year. And so um, this is, um, you know, uh, there's always every every cycle, there are members who get themselves elected to the central committee. And then for whatever reason, something happens in their life, uh, they, they just aren't able to show up and they don't really participate. So this provides a way for the central committee to remove those members, create a vacancy and um, and fill it with somebody who can more actively participate. So three meetings in a calendar year, it's easy to miss three, honestly, uh, which is why I encourage everybody to designate a primary alternate who might be able to cover for you uh, when you um, when you can't come. And notice you can be removed from missing three meetings, right? So if you miss two meetings, then you then, then the next one is the one that makes you kind of eligible for being removed. Uh, it's not like the central committee is eager to do this. It's really more for people who just stop showing up entirely. But you know, there's 12 monthly meetings in a year. If you're missing three of them and don't have somebody coming to represent you, um, it's a question of whether you're really doing your job and as a member of the, of the central committee. Uh, if you affiliate or register with another party, obviously you can't be in the governing body of the uh, Democratic Central Committee. If you publicly publicly advocate that voters support a Republican in any race. Uh, or any candidate who's not a Democrat and is running against an endorsed Democrat. Um, so uh, you can be removed with a two thirds vote. So I want you to notice that it's a Republican, whether there's anybody else running or not, don't endorse your, if you have a Republican friend and we all have one, if you have a Republican friend and that friend comes to you and says, I need your endorsement for my race, you have to tell them, um, I can't do that because I'm a member of the governing board of the Democratic Party and the thousands of Democrats that voted for me to represent them and run the Democratic Party have a right to respect, you know, uh, me not to endorse Republicans. Um, or you could just say, I don't agree with the rule, but the rule says I can't endorse Republicans and I have this partisan rule that's important to me, so I hope you'll understand. Um, then as to other candidates, 
uh, it's a non-Democrat who's running against an endorsed Democrat. So if you, and this rule doesn't apply if you endorse a non-Democrat, let's say a Green Party member or a no party preference person, and as long as they're not running against our endorsed Democrat, uh, this is not invoked. And then uh, the last uh, is failure to pay dues. Um, and so Angelica will talk about dues. The most important thing there is that uh, if you are not able to pay financially, just say that you can't or just say that you want a waiver and, and uh, in the way that, that uh, we provide to do that. Um, and and that's, that's okay. Most people pay their dues and it's helpful to do that without being asked a hundred times. Um, the, so this can be surprising sometimes to people who are former or current elected officials who also run for central committee. Um, and uh, I just want people to be aware of the fact that the endorsement provision, you have to be careful, we have a provision, you are now a governing board member of the Democratic Party, and this is one of the things that um, most often, frankly, comes up um, in that context of elected officials. So those are rules that support removal. Um, these rules provide that you can be censured um, and uh, by two thirds vote. And this is basically much, uh, much softened. Uh, the first two items are much softened from um, uh, previous times. It's basically about, um, uh, this is really more about what happens when you support a Democrat and they're running against an endorsed Democrat. So uh, that's okay under our rules now, provided that you, that candidate and you don't publicly denigrate, defame, malign or insult the person who is our endorsed candidate. Um, and so, or if the candidate you're supporting is accused of having done that, if you repudiate and condemn that statements, you're still okay. Um, and then uh, you're also subject to censure if you violate the rules of uh, decorum that I mentioned earlier. And then um, uh, we have a provision about endorsements, uh, if you violate, if you endorse a non-Democrat running against an endorsed Democrat, then there's an automatic sanction that takes away your participation in the next set of endorsement votes. Um, and that's just by operation of the bylaws and it doesn't require a two thirds vote. Um, and so this comes up every once in a while. It, it, it saves us a lot of grief at the Central Committee, honestly, because we don't have to drag a person before the Central Committee and take a vote uh, to condemn them uh, if they've, uh, you engaged in a misjudgment and, and endorsed a non-Democrat who is running against um, and endorsed um, an endorsed Democrat. Okay, um, legislation. So the bylaws page that was on the link I sent earlier has these four acts that were adopted apparently at the beginning of the, uh, uh, when, when the current bylaws were first written in the early 1990s. So one of them is the Executive Board Duties and Responsibilities Act. There you'll find a more detailed description of each of the directors and what it is that they're uh, is within their role and what they're supposed to be doing, what's within their authority to do, um, and how the executive board meetings are run and how de decisions are made by the executive board. So if you're wondering about how the executive board works and you don't see the answer in the bylaws, it might be in this act. The next one is the United Democratic Campaign Enablement Act. So uh, political parties have superpowers uh, under the campaign finance laws. So for example, for the most part, we can send member communications to Democrats. Our members are Democrats and there's 500,000 of them in Santa Clara County. So if we're able to raise the right kind of money, we can use that to send member, member communications uh, to our Democratic um, uh, uh, voters. Uh, to actually any Democratic household, so um, uh, uh, any household that has a Democratic voter, um, at least one, uh, and, uh, and there are other powers like that. And so we act, uh, though we have, for disclosure purposes, we have to act like any other campaign through a political committee, and our, we have a state committee and a federal committee. Each of them is called the Santa Clara County United Democratic Campaign. Um, and this structure, again, uh, was in response to changes in campaign finance laws in California. Uh, uh, a lot of Democratic parties have something like this structure. And the, this act defines how the Central Committee elects the steering committee that runs our political committees. And so day-to-day -day campaign decisions are made by the United Democratic Campaign Steering Committee. Um, and that has seven members that are, are one of which is uh, by design and by bylaw is appointed by the executive director of the South Bay Labor Council. And then uh, the other six of which are appointed by the central committee on recommendation from the chair. 
and um, the time to renew that will be coming up in 2021. Um, endorsement and local races act. This has the detailed rules about how we do make our endorsement decisions and run our endorsement meetings. Um, this one I would say glance at and uh, be ready to dig into it deeper in uh, 2022 when we get closer to the next round of endorsements. And then finally, the Democratic Clubs Enablement Act. This defines what it takes to get chartered as a club, what kind of activities might get you um, uh, your charter pulled as a club, and uh, just the objectives and such of, of, the, uh, of the club program. And that's a lot of information. We're going to keep moving forward. So um, resolutions. So uh, on, on things that are not in our platform, um, it's helpful to bring resolutions because they give us a chance to debate them, to educate the central committee, to educate the public that attends. And uh, more importantly, um, you know, I talked about the resolutions that have had serious uh, structural and operative uh, impact on the central committee, uh, like creating the gender equity position and creating the youth representative position. Uh, but also, uh, when we pass a resolution as a central committee, as chair and spokesperson for the party, I'm able to advocate in the name of the party uh, on those issues. So, for example, if we pass a resolution and then uh, related matters coming before the San Jose City Council or the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, I'm able to, or is on the governor's desk, as happened in the last cycle, I'm able to write a letter or make an appearance and say, I'm the chair of the Democratic Party. We support doing this. This is why. Um, and so uh, resolutions are really a very, uh, very helpful way to um, highlight an issue and, and give me guidance and authority to be able to speak to it. So um, these are some nuts and bolts about resolutions. The first time you do want to encourage you to work with Michael Vargas, the issues director, uh, to, uh, to get it in the right format. But uh, basically, it's one to three whereas clauses and one or two resolved clauses. This is a format that this California Democratic Party strongly prefers. So if your issue is one where you think that the state party might be able to be made to be interested in it and to pass the resolution, it's helpful to have it in that format from the start. Um, and then they limit to 400 words total, including the title. And for all resolutions, whatever the form, the resolving body is either the Santa Clara County Democratic Central Committee or the Santa Clara County Democratic Party. Um, and that's that's who our central committee uh, is able to speak for and the names we're able to speak in. Um, our, our bylaws say that anybody can bring a resolution to us. They don't have to be a member. But of course, uh, for our group to act on, a, on something, uh, a member has to make a motion uh, and a member has to make a second to pass it. And then a majority vote is required to pass it. Um, we have to be submitted to the executive board uh, to be considered at the next central committee meeting. So the executive board meetings are usually on the third Wednesday, uh, and then the central committee meetings are the first Thursday. So if you think about it, it's kind of not too long after a central committee meeting. There's a little window there where if you want something to go on the next central committee, and it's not like an urgent matter, it's, it's not one that just comes up, uh, you need to plan a little bit so you can present it to the executive board uh, and queue it up to be considered at a future meeting. If it's an emergency, uh, you have to justify that. You have to say what, why it's an emergency, and you have to persuade two thirds of the central committee to include it for action on the night of the upcoming meeting uh, on an emergency basis, even though it hasn't been presented to the executive board. And so if, even if you have something that's considered in your mind to be urgent enough to move in that way, I encourage you to let me know or the chair know as early as possible uh, so that um, uh, we can start to make members aware of it as early as possible. And then uh, we have rules that govern, uh, govern, govern how we do resolutions. Um, specifically, there's a five minute period for the proponents to present information and then answer questions of members. And then there's time for opponents, if there's organized opposition speaking for in an opposing position to speak to the resolution. But then those people are excused, kind of set aside uh, so that members can then have discussion and central committee members have a chance to say what they want to say, uh, advocating for or against the resolution, and then we take a vote to decide whether to pass it. And then there's just stuff that's under um, under the um, rules of order for discussion. So um, as you gain experience uh, in on our central committee, um, you'll see that there's an opportunity. You can make a suggestion for amendment. You can make a formal motion for amendment, um, and there's ways to influence what um, uh, uh, what comes out and is finally voted on uh, in, in a resolution. Okay, 
Good. So we're now going to hear from our officers and directors, but I feel like I've put out a lot of information. So I'm going to um, I'm going to stop sharing for now so I can see everybody. And if you would like to ask a question now, you could raise your blue hand uh, if there's anything that we've been going over that you're concerned about or, or just speak up because we're again, not such a big group. And we'll, we'll pause just for a minute and then uh, hear from our officers and directors who are present. Jenny Higgins, I see your hand. Yeah, I have a question about, yes. um, I guess, I don't know if you call it protocol. Mm -hmm. So when we are voting on something and sometimes you say, I'm gonna take three more questions, I was once in a situation where somebody said something that was completely untrue, um, which most of the, actually, I can give you the example. They said that we don't, we're not allowed to do dual endorsements, which I know the DNC doesn't allow it, but we actually do it. So how do we just let that pass? Like, how can, can you, can you correct something in the record or is my question clear? Yeah, I it kind of is. So, so we don't keep, as is typical of governing boards, you'll see that if you go to the website and look at a couple of months of minutes, our minutes are usually fairly high level. They really talk about the actions that were taken, uh, maybe who was present and who spoke to or for or against something. Um, so, but I think that there are provisions under Robert, Robert's rules um, uh, that would have allow one an opportunity to um, uh, uh, to try to clarify something that might be a f might lead to a factual mis mis misunderstanding, and so um, there's an appropriate thing and an inappropriate thing. And uh, as chair, uh, a, a person running the meeting might allow something to be done in this way, or they might not, depending on on, on whether they considered it to be helpful and appropriate or, or not appropriate. So, give it you just kind of taking the the framework of the example you gave. So somebody might raise their hand and say uh, uh, that they want to make a point of information, raise a point of information, right? It's like, I want to make a point of information. It's technically true that the state party doesn't allow dual endorsements, but our bylaws within my understanding are that they do. Or you can ask a question and because a point of information is the chair, is, is, it, am I, is my understanding correct that, that while the state party doesn't allow it, our local bylaws do allow us to dual endorse. That's one way to, it can be done. Now, um, uh, a, a thing that people sometimes try to do is they'll say, you know, a point of information and they'll go on arguing about why they think it's a dual endorsement yeah. is a good idea because Carol and Jane are both good candidates and we really want to support them both. That's an inappropriate way to try to use that, to try to sort of extend the debate and get another right. chance yeah. to make argument uh, in the form of making a point of uh, information. But if it's really about you're concerned that some members might have been misled by something or misunder might, there might be a misunderstanding about something that's factual or about the rules, um, then that is a fair point to, to raise. That's exactly what I was looking yeah. for. Sure. Thank sure. you. Okay, good. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have a full uh, view of everybody who is present. Angelica Ramos, are you still uh, present? How are you? There you are. Do you want to talk about the treasurer role and, uh, and all the great uh, consequences that has and meanings it has for members of the Central Committee? Sure. Uh, good, e good morning, Democrats. I'm sorry I'm wearing a blankie. I'm really cold. It's just so cold. Um, so uh, my job as the treasurer is to collect dues from all members and um, uh, all voting members, uh, which include our club reps and and, uh, and um, our ex officio um, members. So everyone that he has given you, those are the people that um, we have to chase down dues for. Um, People generally wait until the very last minute. Um, you probably don't want to do that because I'll probably send you an email saying that your voting privileges will be revoked. Um, we haven't had to do that, so that's good. Um, just to uh, clarify something, I created a process for those who uh, would like their dues waived for whatever reason. We don't ask those questions. That's not us. And usually um, I ask people to just fill out a form and you just say, I request for my dues to be waived. Again, you don't have to give a reason. We don't, we don't ask for that um, information. So um, other than that, I'm happy to take questions um, or um, you can always send me a note if you have any uh, feedback. But Bill, anything else? No, that's perfect. And so um, I put into the uh, chat a little bit.ly link that I created that goes to the dues paying page. So uh, the dues are 
$25 a year that can be paid as a, a $150 payment at the beginning. And we keep track of that and don't bother you in the second year or as $25 a year. Or actually, if you sign up to be a monthly donor uh, in a, an amount sufficient to be at least your annual dues, um, uh, and there's a page to do that on our sccdp.org webpage. Any of those ways are sufficient, and you just need to let us know that um, that you're that you're doing that. Okay. Uh, I'll give some um, quick clarification to the chat questions. Ava, you were I don't were you a member of a club or an alternate for someone? If you were not, your dues like so alternate members. I technically don't ask for their dues. I mean, Ava is, an, Ava is an incoming uh, elected member and so, or elected right. equivalent and member. I understand that, but she had paid last year too. Ah, right? okay, good. So exactly. And so that, you know, that is a difficult uh, discussion that we should probably have. Um, but associate members technically don't need to pay dues. That's why I don't ask them for it. Um, but you pay them. Uh, and, uh, you know, your dues come with your, when you're seated. Right, so you haven't been sworn in yet, so technically those are not attached to your um, your term or whatever. Right. So anybody, it's anybody, you, everybody will have to pay, unfortunately, uh, uh, when uh, we start the term in twenty twenty one. Right, year. and it's per year, and um, I will work hopefully with whoever uh, John, I guess, to make the um, the page more clear. It's sometimes confusing. I know that people ask me multiple times why it was um, 2018, 2019 dues or something like that, but that was the link I was given. So yeah. we'll hopefully update that and make sure it's not as confusing um, when we're asking for your money. Um, you can pay for your entire, like, well, I think there was something where we tried to do two years at the same time. Um, so people have been paying every year for two years um, so that's the confusing part as well. But mm -hmm. um, so my apologies that it's not clear, but we will make sure it's clear for the new yeah. year. Yeah, it's basically twenty five dollars a year. It's two and a half bucks uh, a, a month. Uh, so not not huge. Um, I see hands. So uh, I don't know if these are questions for Angelica or for me, Miriam, and then Allie. Yes, um, I just would like to see some, like maybe a spreadsheet or Google Doc or something, Google Sheet, that shows us that here's our names. And and the, and we already paid or we haven't paid. I belong to another organization. They charge every six months, so you can look in there and it tells that you are paid until September or you are paid until December. Then we don't have to get worried. I honestly don't even remember if I paid or not. I mean, in the past, I know that this new year is coming up. I'm not talking about that. Well, I, like uh, Angelica was saying, I'm pretty sure you paid because we were pretty strict and tracked everybody down in the end, uh, but right. it was a bunch of work. So we're trying to get away right. from the bunch of work part. Yeah, so but thank you for that suggestion. If we can do that in a way that protects everybody's privacy, I think that would be okay. But I'm not sure we have the information systems to let you do a lookup of just yourself, but we can, we can figure that out. We might be able to do something like that where you enter your name and are told your due status. Uh, it might be possible for us to do that. Okay, that would be okay. great. Thank you. Good. Uh, Allie Hughes. Um, thank you so much for, for letting me ask the question. Um, yeah. So I was, uh, so I was uh, recently elected this past March. So would my dues start being, um, I would have to start paying in 2021. And then that $50 payment would cover 2021 and 2022. Uh, yes. I, is that right, yes. Angelica? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Good. All right, thank you very much. And uh, so um, I'm going to drop into the chat. I don't think Helen Chapman is here this morning. Helen Chapman is the uh, secretary and she keeps the minutes for the executive board and the minutes for the central committee uh, meetings. The things that help uh, Helen and uh, the secretary do their job is to make sure you, uh, while we're in Zoom uh, uh, COVID world, uh, to make sure that you, um, to make sure that you, fill out the roster form uh, so that she knows you're there and have that information, the record of that information. And then I'm going to drop into the chat a, uh, a link. Uh, uh, let's make sure I have this. Yeah, this is a link for a form you can use to make sure that Helen has your information uh, for the roster. And this uh, is a, a Google form that will, if you fill it out, she'll be able to populate our roster. So if you're a returning an existing member and you maybe your information has changed, like you have a new address um, or anything like that, you can use that form to provide that information or new email, new phone, 
or if you're a new member, please, and you haven't already, please fill out that form. It's the same link that I've sent to you previously. And that way, Helen won't have to go out and ask you individually for your information. Um, good. So next on my list uh, is our executive director, James Kim. James, are you prepared to speak? Hello, everyone. Congratulations to new uh, members and congratulations to uh, returning members. I think I met just about everybody, including Frank, that I met today. So my position is an appointed position. I guess uh, in order to describe what I do, in simple as possible ways, I run day-to-day -day operations of a local party, mostly through the headquarters. Uh, as you can see from Bill's presentation that, that we have a lot of directors. So I interface with all the directors. And in the past, you know, I was interfacing with John Kaminsky, communication director, campaign services for the registration, endorsements. So it feels like I could say this, I hope Bill's gonna be okay with this, is that uh, I sort of fill in the holes when there's work to do. So basically, uh, other than the title, that's how I would describe my position. Today, I actually would like to ask all of the members here today to take an action, a simple action. Please help us do an outreach more to the general public, general Democrat. And in order to do that, you could actually uh, sign up to volunteer at SCCDP. And what will happen is you'll be on our uh, mailing list, email list, action updates, regular newsletter, and volunteer opportunities will be sent to you regularly. Another way, of course, that you could take an action today is if you go on your social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, make sure that when you see, when you have time, of course, you know, read our articles, read our posts, you know, share it, click like, uh, promote it, how, whatever you could do to help spread the news of what we're trying to do. If, I, if all of us could do that, and we could kind of replicate this with all the members of our county party, as well as a Democrat in the county, 500,000 Democrats maybe does not need to be sent a reminder to vote because they will be engaged already. Uh, I think all of us could do that today. So thank you so much for coming here. And uh, if you have any questions, my email address is one of the simplest ones. I'm going to post it on a a chat and you can send me uh, uh, questions directly. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, James Kim. Uh, Judy Pipkin is our Director of, uh, voter, of uh, voter Registration and Community Services. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Judy. Thank you. Because okay. I'm, I'm on the computer and on the phone because I've got the audio through the phone and the picture through the computer. Anyway. You're good. Um, um, <laughs> Director of Voter Registration and Community Service, and I, along with James Kim, uh, work the office on Moore Park, and our job never stops. It goes uh, all year round every year, uh, engaging with volunteers and just being available and uh, doing special events uh, for, uh, out in the county. So um, that's what I do. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned earlier, both James and Judy um, could tell you stories. We won't take time this morning about the kinds of questions they get. And sometimes they're off the wall and sometimes they're uh, angry. Sometimes they're scary and downright threatening. Uh, so they've really been on the front line. So thank you, Judy. And, and thank you, James, for dealing with the public uh, and representing our Democratic Party and all that work. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, call on Shay. Shay franco Clausen is the Director of Gender Equity and the Status of Women. Are you with us, Shay? Uh oh, she might have stepped away. Let's see who's next. Mm -hmm. who's, oh, hey, you are, Shay. Shay, it's your turn to just uh, introduce yourself and, and mention briefly your your um, directorship and, and what it does. Okay, hold on. Let me get this. It's on there my you phone. Are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, good morning, Democrats. Uh, my name is Shay franco Clausen. I'm the Director of Gender and Equity, um, really advocating for um, women and girls here in the county. I serve also on the Commission on the Status of Women and very work a lot in criminal justice reform, especially in our local 
county jails, Elmwood facility, juvenile hall, and the ranch. Um, specifically, I really think that when we talk about equity in meeting those goals that Jean, she mentioned earlier, it is about not only um, planting the seed, watering it with other women, and building a movement where women are taking up not just, you know, 50%, uh, but more. I think if we're trying to uh, accommodate those goals, it comes with training, working together, and making sure that we are ha we have a strong pathway to get women uh, elected in public office here. Um, we have a lot of things coming up this year. We've had a rocky 2020, but I look forward to always partnering with women in the community, um, our vice chair, uh, Jean, and Angelica Ramos, who's been a leader in working for uh, women's rights. So um, that's a little bit about myself. Thank you for the opportunity to speak up. Very good. Thank you, Shay. Uh, Alex, the club's director. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Laura Mecca-Penlack. I am the club's director. Um, we have about over 20 clubs um, that are chartered um, with the local party. Um, and as Bill had mentioned, all of those clubs do have a representative to the central committee. Um, so I really just work with the clubs um, to help them recharter, to navigate um, anything they want me to bring to the executive board. And then I also um, work with the executive board to charter new clubs. So we have quite a lot of people who want to start a club, which is great. Um, so the, you know, um, the more clubs we have, the um, more active Democrats we have. Um, so that's what I do. Thank you, Alex. Clarence Madrelejos, the Director of Candidate Recruitment and Endorsement. Clarence? All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Clarence Madrelejos. I am the Director of Candidate Recruitment and Endorsements. It's actually a position, I, it's more on the endorsement side than the candidate recruitment side. And the reason why I'm in, in that thinking is that our endorsement process needs to be a fair and process for both um, the members of the endorsement of the Central Committee, but also for the candidates who are seeking our endorsement. Um, and the, our endorsement process is actually laid out in one of the few documents uh, that um, one of the one of the few documents that um, that's linked with the director. And my and my membership of my committee is I personally I of all the directors I do not choose my committee. Um, I get the privilege of having Bill or the party chair choose the members of the committee and each of the Democratic clubs choosing the members of who I'll be working with during the, the election cycle in terms of screening candidates, interviewing them, and overall try to create a process, as I mentioned earlier, to be fair and transparent and to be reflective of our values as Democrats. So I'm um, talking with the issues director, talking to members of the, um, the, um, the e-board, central committee members, trying to craft a um, the questions, the training uh, to the endorsement committee members and make sure that the time that we present the recommendation to the full endorsement committee, it, the candidates are fully vetted um, and we can be able to defend our recommendations adequately. And if it fails, and that's the right of the central committee to overrule the, the endorsement committee. So I, um, it's been a pleasure for the last two years um to be uh, serving that position and um look forward to see how this party will be handling the endorsements in, in the years to come thank you clarence uh, i'm going down in alphabetical order because that's how i see people so there's another james kim who is our finance director he shouldn't be confused with executive director james kim uh, when finance director james kim and the executive director and i are always working on a pro are working together on something we tell people we've got all the Jameses working on it. Uh, and uh, so Finance Director James Kim. Uh, hi, I'm James. Um, so the Finance Director role, as I understand it, is primarily a fundraising role. Um, and so there are kind of maybe three major fundraising campaigns in the year. So there's the annual dinner, um, which we had virtually this year, is, is a very large fundraiser um, that we hold. Uh, second is the monthly um, donation program. And I put a link in the chat and this is kind of best way for us to get kind of a predictable revenue stream um, into the county party. If you can donate $5, $10, $25 a month, whatever you can. And, and the, the plea that I make at every meeting is um, it would be you know great if you can become a monthly sustaining recurring donor. And if you can uh, find one or two friends to also become monthly donors. 
uh, in addition to that, then there are other um, fundraisers that we plan throughout the year. And you know, these funds are what allow us to run the office and send out mailers and you know, support uh, campaigns. Thank you very much, uh, James. And so an advantage of doing a monthly donation using the link that uh, James indicated is, as I said, if you, as long as your uh, donations add up to your $25 or more a year, uh, that can count towards your, as, as a satisfying your dues obligation. And so the easiest thing, if you hope to be on the Central Committee for a while, is to sign up for a monthly donation at a level that you're comfortable at. Obviously, we're hoping you will do something more substantial, like 5 or $10 or even more. And uh, that money is extremely helpful. Uh, from you and from friends who you might be able to get to give because it's federal money and it's the money we can use to do um, uh, work that might touch on federal federal elections, which includes voter registration. Also, uh, James mentioned our office and uh, that uh, it's just not possible to operate uh, year round uh, without uh, ongoing support. And so that's a pretty important way to do it. And that's something that James has been focused on. And I think especially since we're not, uh, may not be able to have a big dinner event for a bit longer still into 2021, we're really going to be depending on individual donations uh, to, to get through the coming period. So thank you, James, for, for that work. Uh, John Comiskey is the Director of Communications. Hello, uh, thank you. The, as Director of Communications, I have uh, three ongoing uh, themes that we pursue. Uh, first is news and events. Uh, this would be club meetings, special events, fundraisers for endorsed candidates, uh, and, and uh, volunteer opportunities, activist opportunities. The second is uh, the Central Committee business. Uh, as, as members of the Central Committee, you'll receive emails every month about when the meetings are and how to attend. We're doing it all virtually now. Eventually, we will meet in person again, and that's how you get your uh, information about when and where that will be. And you'll also get specific instructions on how to vote electronically while we're meeting uh, virtually. And then the third thing is just outreach to the rest of the world. And I do these uh, things with three different mechanisms. Uh, the first is we have a, uh, an email list with about 3,000 people on it. Uh, that's where all the news and events goes. There's a subset for the Central Committee business, uh, so only Central Committee members and their alternates get that information. And also the executive director makes use of that to communicate with the volunteers. Um, we have our website. I put the uh, link in the, in the chat, uh, and that communicates the same kind of news and events information and Central Committee business. All of our agendas and minutes are there. And also the executive director uh, shares that website as a means of communicating with our volunteers. And then the third thing I mentioned was in-person engagement. I've been spending time connecting with uh, and communicating with uh, the various resistance groups that came into existence about four years ago uh, and are still going strong and doing great work um, and generating a lot of activist opportunities. And when I do this, I follow some principles developed by Saul Alinsky, who was a labor organizer in the 40s and 50s and a anti-war organizer in the uh, 60s and 70s. And he says that when you communicate with another group, you should meet them on their turf, you should speak in their language, and you should remain humble. And in order to speak in people's language, that means you have to listen and you have to learn how it is they express themselves and you have to express and you have to respect uh, the, the means that they use to communicate their message. And remaining humble is important uh, because you don't want to come in and say, I'm from the Democratic Party. I know how you should be doing this. Replace your methods with ours. Uh, it, it's a two-way communication. We can learn as much from these groups as, as we can help them learn from us. Um, and it's a great source of uh, new members and new engagement and new activists and some of the newly elected members uh, came to us through these resistance groups. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I do. Um, other communications needs come up on a short-term basis, and I try to address those as, as quickly and smoothly as I can. And I work closely with the executive director and the chair and the vice chair to make sure that the information gets out to the right people in a timely manner. 
And uh, if you have anything that you would like communicated, you can get stuff on our calendar. Uh, you can submit events to your to our calendar yourself through our website, or you can send me an email. Uh, a good piece of communications includes a catchy title, a little short blurb of what's it about, uh, a, a link to a website where people can sign up or get more information, and a picture. Pictures are very important. The internet is a very visual medium, and it's good to have some kind of picture to catch people's eyes. So if, if you want uh, to help me find uh, new information to communicate to our members. Those are the kinds of things that I'm going to need from you. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, those principles, by the way, the Salinsky principles, of course, uh, apply in other contexts as well, like when you're dealing with elected officials or democratic clubs, ones we've chartered and ones from other organizations, uh, pretty much everywhere. And uh, I have found that it's, I've not gotten very far when um, when I when I go to a meeting and say, you know, I'm the chair of the Democratic Party and I'm in charge around here. Uh, so uh, that uh, that's the humility part has been pretty important. Um, so we have just I think we've covered everybody in terms of our officers and directors. And um, I have just a couple more slides I'd like to cover. I, I want to stay on time. And so I'm not I'm going to blow through our break. Uh, I hope that will be OK. I think we'll be done here in just a few minutes and then I'm going to stick around for anybody's questions. And uh, if at that time people want to take a break and come back or just drop off, um, that will be uh, that will be good. So I apologize for not sticking with the plan to take a break, but I want to get you all released for your your Saturday uh, so you can do things uh, around your house. Uh, so um, last two slides, just as an a review of, of ways to become more actively involved. I said this at the beginning before we kind of started formally with the presentation. But um, uh, my observation is that a good number of members of our central committee hang back and don't lean into and get engaged in the work of the central committee. And uh, it, it's really up to you uh, to look for the thing you would like to do and to work with me and others to, to create that opportunity and space. Uh, so these are just a variety of ways that you can become involved. Uh, one or more of them may resonate with you. And if you have other ideas, I'm very happy to speak with you about them. Uh, becoming an officer and director. So I wouldn't run for officer or director uh, or, uh, right away uh, if you're a new member, but if you're interested in a position and would like to talk about it, I'm very happy to do that. But over time, we do want to see and develop people to take on leadership positions. All of the officer and director roles are very significant volunteer opportunities, both in terms of what you get to do and what you're expected to do. So there are very significant time commitments and I can help um, uh, anybody understand uh, what those would be if you'd like. Uh, we have a couple of committees. So uh, Clarence mentioned the endorsement committee. Uh, really, it's the central committee that decides the central committee's representatives. I don't uh, appoint uh, hardly anybody uh, without uh, consulting the central committee. What we typically do is we have the clubs appoint their representatives. Clarence and I look at the diversity of opinions and political philosophy and people that comes out of that group. And I try to uh, use the positions that remain to propose a slate to the central committee that will result in a well representative uh, uh, endorsement committee. And the couple of cycles that we've done that together, Clarence and I, we've ended up with a really good committee that I've been very proud of. Um, uh, preparing for the meetings being an active member by reading the agenda. If nothing else, always read the agenda when it comes to you by email. There's a link that goes to the webpage. If you haven't gotten email yet and you know the meeting's coming up, you can always go to the webpage and find the agenda there. Um, and uh, and reading just reading the resolutions so that you don't go to the meeting and find out that somebody's trying to pass a resolution that's actually very insensitive to a community that you know more about than the proponents do, or that overlooks something that you know about, or that just takes a position to which you're diametrically opposed, which happens even among Democrats. It's important to prepare ahead of time so that you can bring your substantive points, bring your specific proposals to amend, things like that. Um, uh, it, so resolutions are pretty important. Uh, draft and promote resolutions. We have 12 meetings in the year. The executive board and I make the agenda for those meetings. And part of every agenda is basically trying to identify those resolutions that members have brought forward that we're going to be considered at that upcoming meeting. And so if you uh, care about uh, an area that you don't see the central committee speaking to, write a resolution. It's a great vehicle. It forces the executive board to address it. It brings it to the central committee to address it. And we you know, might together take some action on it. And then you can use that as a basis of further uh, advocacy. 
Um, and then if you do a resolution, you can go around to like-minded organizations and get co-sponsors. You can get other members in our central committee to join you as sponsors. Um, and then you can advocate for them and, and participate in the voting on them. Uh, recruiting candidates to run for elected office, uh, helping candidates get our endorsement, helping them participate in our training. Those are all things that members of the Central Committee uh, spend time doing and that I, I recommend to you. And then I think it was um, James who asked people to sign up to volunteer. If you go to the website sccdp.org, there's like a general volunteer sign up form. And also, so that's the benefit of that is that you will then get the emails that go out to people who have expressed interest in volunteering. So even if you don't immediately have time to do something, you will at least be on that list and you'll see what opportunities are being promoted to um, people who are on that list. And we've been collecting uh, campaign related activities at the page listed here, httpaction.sccdp.org. You can also get it from the Action Center tab on the sccdp.org website. And if you go there now, you'll see that the, we're doing phone banks for Georgia, which are the Georgia Senate runoff, uh, Sundays and Mondays, possibly adding a day. Um, and that's, um, uh, you know, the work of the party that other volunteers involved in the Central Committee's work are creating. Um, you know, that that's being posted there and being promoted in various channels to people. And if you want to know what your local party is doing, sign up for one of these. And you can see that the many people showing up for our phone banks and many, many people engaged in our work. And uh, last thing I'm going to talk about the organizational meeting in January. And then I'm going to hang out as long as people would like to answer questions. And I'm always available to be contacted with questions. But the meeting on January 7th is an important meeting. Uh, first of all, if you can't make that meeting for whatever reason, and you want to make sure that your vote is, is available, you should um, designate your primary alternate or a proxy for that meeting before that meeting so that we know that that person is going to participate for you. Um, the bylaws prescribe an order of, of, of events for this meeting. Uh, the first is the oath of office. Uh, the oath of office that we'll do is the traditional oath of office that's in the Constitution, the California Constitution. Now, the political parties don't have to follow um, uh, certain uh, uh, norms uh, because they're independent of, meant to be independent of the government. And so there's actually a court case that says that members who are elected to the Central Committee can't be compelled by law to take this oath of office. So the oath of office is kind of optional. It's in our bylaws, uh, optional in the sense of legal requirement, but our bylaws require it. So if you have any concerns about taking the oath of office, it's the one that you take when you swear as a candidate anyways to, to support and uphold the Constitution. And uh, it'll be administered at the beginning of our January meeting. Um, but I guess, you know, if you, if you are comfortable with it, you can let me know and mumble the words or something like that. Um, then we fill vacancies because there'll be some votes taken afterwards. So uh, we only had three members from Santa Clara County within Assembly District 29 uh, file for um, a central committee. So there are three uh, vacancies to be filled in Assembly District 29. All the other assembly districts have their full complement. Um, and so if you know somebody who lives in the part of Assembly District 29 that's in Santa Clara County, it's like Almaden Valley and South San Jose areas, um, then uh, they might would be eligible to be elected and could run to fill these vacancies. So we'll have to have a little election. And in COVID times, those take some patience because John Comiskey and I have to manipulate and use our, our backend forms to, to figure out who everybody's voted for. Um, the accreditation of clubs happens next. This is an important step because the clubs have representatives for their representatives to have votes in the term starting in the January meeting, the uh, clubs have to be accredited. And so uh, the clubs have the deadline for submitting paperwork um, has already passed. Um, and uh, Alex has been reaching out to clubs with some follow up questions um, to collect the papers. Uh, and the list of clubs that has satisfied their requirements will be presented at, the, at this point in this meeting. And then their representatives will be seated and can participate in the vote. Um, then after those things are done, there's the election of officers. And the order is, uh, is chair, vice chair, secretary, and treasurer. Um, the outgoing vice chair or the current vice chair, Gene Cohen, will conduct the election for chair. I am running for chair. I know that Gene's running for vice chair. Um, and, uh, and I anticipate that Helen and Angelica may run for their seats as well. I don't want to speak for them. But um, uh, there could be other candidates as well. And the election of chairs, election of officers will happen at that point in the meeting. 
Um, then we elect members to the Democratic State Central Committee, also known as state convention delegates. And we're fortunate because we have a growing number of Democrats in Santa Clara County. Party identification has been decreasing, but in Santa Clara County, we've just recently gone up over 500,000 registered Democrats. And by the formula that allows allocates state delegates to our central committee, uh, that we have a sufficient number to elect our elected and elected equivalent members to the state central committee. In fact, we have a few more. And then later, if some people get elected to their um, uh, assembly districts uh, uh, delegates instead and prefer that, then we would have vacancies that we could fill at a later, a later meeting. Um, the bylaws also require that we form a bylaws review committee. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in serving on that, you can let me know. Um, and then any other business that we would normally have in a normal uh, meeting. And then people sometimes wonder about all the director positions. The, those are filled actually in the February or March meeting under the bylaws, and that gives the elected officers a chance to work together to work up a slate of, uh, of people. So now um, we're at questions, and I think you all have my email address because I've been communicating with you about these meetings. I think I've been sending also this, this calendar um, uh, tool, which has um, some office hour times. I'm going to copy that actually and put it in the uh, chat. Um, and uh, that's just a giant fire hose of, of information uh, that uh, I've been sending your way. And I'm gonna pause now. And uh, if you have a question, you can either raise your blue hand or, uh, or, uh, or just speak up, I think at this point. Let's see, I don't see any blue. I have a question. Yes, Jenny. Jenny, um, if you know someone that wants to be a delegate for AD 29, how do they, uh, they email you or how do they get? That's a very good question. So our bylaws don't specify any process. There's no like filing in advance required or anything. So they don't really have to do anything, but they'll need somebody to nominate them on January 7th. And if they want to have a good chance of being selected, they should be reaching out to central committee members to line up votes. And so um, the, what the, pro, the procedure will be that we'll call for nominations at the meeting. That'll be a list of people then. Uh, to, to be eligible, they have to be registered as a Democrat in Assembly District 29, the part of Assembly District 29 in Santa Clara County. And uh, so I suppose it would actually be helpful if they were to email me or Helen Chapman, uh, just because then we can do a quick check to verify. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times people who identify as Democrats don't realize that they're not actually registered as a Democrat. They registered, declined to stay for whatever reason. Um, uh, so that, that uh, and they have to live uh, in Mark Stone's district, uh, assembly district, uh, that part of it that's in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Sure. Any, any other questions about all the uh, information or the uh, organizing meeting? If, if not, uh, I'll hang out for a minute as people drop off. Feel free to hang back if you're afraid to ask your question or just uh, think of a question as others drop off. Uh, but thank you all for taking time uh, to hear out uh, all, of, all the information about how we're organized. I hope you'll at least have uh, these kernels of information so that as specific things come up in your work on the central committee, you, you know, you'll, you'll know where to look for information or you'll know you can ask me about it. Um, but it is a, um, uh, you know, it's like Robert's rules. It all looks very complicated when you try to understand it in the abstract, but it makes sense usually when it comes down to application. And I've been doing this for a while. So uh, if uh, you have a question, I'd likely know the answer or know how to find it out. So thank you very much for being here. I hope you all have a great weekend. I wanna mention that I hope everybody stays safe. I know that the COVID stuff is crazy. Um, I'm so glad that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are coming. I think it's going to be night and day, and I think we're going to have a, a better time coming. But in the meantime, um, you know, I hope everybody will be well and, and, and stay safe and, and uh, uh, let us know if, uh, if we can be of any uh, support to you as you deal with COVID or as you enter into your service as Central Committee members. So thank you very much. Thank you, Democrat. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Thank, thank you, directors. Thank you. I actually would like to share this information to Bill publicly. I got a note from Linda Sell wanting to donate some money. Oh. Ah, that's great. Well, well, I have no objection to Linda Sell or anybody else donating some money to our Democratic Party. We need, we need uh, the support. I'm not sure that note was supposed to be sent to me, but you know, anyways, I responded. Um, uh -huh. You should have an email that 
to well that's one of those examples receiving and accepting donations all the Jameses are willing to participate in uh, <laughs> in, uh, in that activity <laughs> thank you Bye, very everybody. good thank you everybody look forward to working with you on the central committee thank you bye bye very good good meeting bill I oh yeah it's a lot of information i'm sure that uh, it probably felt like uh, more overwhelming than helpful but uh, usually it does help to to get some questions answered in advance so so mia you know you know more about the central committee than most people ever will know <laughs> and uh, if you bill if you could send me that slide i'm gonna try to use that to train new headquarters staff so ah good idea <laughs>